Since we have a record here, it's very helpful if you would identify who you are and if you're testifying on behalf of some organization uh, to identify the organization, if you're testifying on behalf of yourself to, uh, uh, to, to, to note that, that as well. So uh, we appreciate all of you being here today and we'll turn it over to you, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Trevor Taylor, uh, members of the committee. My name is Trevor Taylor and I'm representing the uh, Texas Trial Lawyers here today. I'm a solo practitioner uh, here in Austin. Uh, I'm here largely uh, to act as a resource witness to the extent folks have questions uh, about the charge or our experience with it. Uh, my short thumbnail uh, testimony is uh, I've looked at some of the survey data from our experience here uh, with the exp expedited trial rule and it appears to be, at least for tort cases, the survey seemed to say that for contract cases there may have been a, a greater effect, but for tort cases, what we're seeing is about the same rates of settlement and a uh, slightly higher trial rate and a slightly uh, lower summary judgment rate. Um, the summary judgment rates before, at least for the sort of cases that you would ordinarily see in an expedited trial procedure, small car wreck cases and the like, aren't ordinarily you don't see a lot of summary judgment motion practice in those cases anyway. Uh, I think before the rule it was around 20%. Uh, after the rule, it's gone down to about 5%, which sort of tells me uh, that we're getting to trial more, more frequently. We're getting to trial more often. Uh, the plaintiff's bar supports any effort to move cases uh, more quickly and to get to trial more quickly. Uh, Let that, me that stop is, you right sure. there. For uh, any of, and, and I don't want to put you on the spot, and I know you probably didn't come prepared to talk about this, but and if you didn't, that's fine. But could you just give, uh, just for the committee, kind of a, a brief overview of, of how the expedite, expedited uh, trial process works. It goes back, I think, to the 82nd session when uh, the, and it was designed to try to provide a, a fast track for certain cases, as, as I recall the, the history. But if you could kind of sure. just summarize how it works. Sure. Uh, what we intended, what I think was intended for a certain type of case, for cases uh, that have civil cases that have damage values less than $100,000. The idea was to expedite the trial process for that, the discovery process for that. And what we wound up, what wound up being done is creating a 180-day discovery period that you could exchange written discovery, you could conduct depositions. 180-day uh, discovery period, and then following that 180-day discovery period. Uh, you had a trial window, you could be guaranteed, once your 180 days of discovery was completed, you would be guaranteed a trial. Uh, one of the parties could ask for a trial within 90 days of completion of discovery. So it was meant to sort of give a preferential type setting to those types of uh, smaller cases. The other big change was in mediation. Lots of counties, and I think the survey talks to this, lots of counties had general rules that you are in mediation unless you opt out. Uh, this rule, the, the expedited trial rules sort of changed that some, uh, over, overriding, I guess, the local rule in, in all the, uh, that any particular county may have, and that the parties could get together and decide mediation isn't useful, and if they agreed, you could avoid that sort of mandatory mediation requirement altogether. So those were sort of the big changes, and talking to the trial bar, the, the, uh, on the plaintiff side at least, cutting down the number of interrogatories from 25 to 15 on the discovery side has been a, uh, a useful development. And then having a, a tool to get to trial, uh, the requirement that it get there uh, 90, day, or 90 days with, within completion of discovery is a, a useful tool as well. Is that? Yeah, that's very helpful. And I guess uh, part of what I'm wondering is whether the Trial Lawyers Association has any position whether we should leave it alone or, or repeal it or, uh, or else make changes to it. Uh, we're ready to work with the committee on, on whatever. Uh, I've seen there have been some recommendations uh, uh, from the report from some sort of compliance question as to whether people were actually part of the first step is putting yourself in the expedited trial process and you have to, you were supposed to by Rule 47 put your pleading what your damages were going to be. Some people, uh, that was a, a new change that some lawyers have failed to comply with it looks like. Um, the, the uh, recommendation of the report seems to be reasonable. One of my experience has been with e-filing system. A lot of times, that's a, I've seen it more in uh, more than one county. The, the question gets asked because it's on our civil jury uh, sheets that we have to submit anyway. So I think there, 
there are ways of tweaking that compliance. Um, so there are things we can do that we're willing to, to certainly work with the committee on, trying to take some steps to, to tighten the rule and, and make it work better. Okay. And we welcome Ms. Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Uh, and Chairman. appreciate you being here, and Sorry, we'll note your presence on the record. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any anything else, sir? I'll open it up to questions if you're, you're okay. finished. Well, the the only right. other the only okay. other point I wanted to make it. I, I think I think for certain types of cases, it has uh, it has served its purpose. For certain types of uh, car wreck personal injury cases, it served its purpose. I think there's some variation by county. You know, the 90 day get to trial rule uh, varies uh, by county and jurisdiction depending on the court you're in. Um, in Travis County, it's worked uh, fine getting getting trial settings. I've had to, I've heard anecdotally and. From other lawyers that practice out in uh, in um, rural counties that may have uh, criminal dockets that take precedent over over civil dockets, that it's it's created some problem in in uh, in uh, scheduling. But uh, uh, but those are things we're willing to work with the committee and are now. All right. Any questions for for Mr. Taylor, Mr. Sheets? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Real quick question, sir. The um, well, two questions actually. Uh, any problem with the rules that were promulgated by the Supreme Court as it relates to expedited matters? The rules that we've been following? The, the, right, the, because, because the, the statute directed the Supreme Court to create rules, and I'm just wondering how are the rules implementing with the statute? I, I don't know that there's been a problem, but I'm, I, uh, I can certainly go back and, and supplement this record if, if, uh, uh, if need be. But I, I haven't heard that. Are you talking about the changes to uh, 902? Rule of Evidence 902. Real, and yeah, just in general, the rule of civil procedure. I mean, I haven't seen any problems with that. I just, I, from the defense perspective, I'm just wondering from the trial bar. If, or I haven't seen any. I, I, I saw, I saw some reference to some problems in in this report, uh, and it, as I sort of work through them, I don't think they're unique to expedited trials. So uh, I would say uh, I haven't seen any. I'm okay. Not aware of any. And how about the uh, the new disclosure rule that you use for expedited matters? Any heartache over that? The new disclosure. Yeah, the disclosure rule that's in the rules that says basically you can put out a disclosure that says give me everything, and if they don't give you everything, they can't use it at trial. All right. I, I haven't heard of any problem with the disclosure rule okay. uh, to date. Any other questions? Well, we appreciate you being here, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.